Seeing as I'm now back after my almost two month break of feeling like opening Premiere and my two week vacay to Australia turning into a complete disaster because nobody told me how hard it would be to find a living Tasmanian tiger, maybe it's time for me to actually do something more important with my life, like watch that new Jujutsu Kaisen opening. Play games play games again. I was really hoping one of you fucks would tell me that these guys went extinct over 80 years ago before I wasted my time because not only did I fly back with a measurable disappointment, but I may have accidentally afflicted my entire flight with the COVID-19 virus because apparently I have that shit now too. Remember 12 year old you hiding under your blankets while listening to scary stories of chupacabra encounters? <coughs> but for some reason they are weirdly comforting knowing that the chupacabras were out there and you were still safe under your covers? Because that's kind of how I feel about today's topic, Sayana Uda. My first time opening the Song of Saya was one of the most horrific experiences hey, I think I've ever had. Ass. Not because of the game itself, but because I didn't know you had to turn down the volume of visual novels to like 2% before playing them, so when my little innocent ears were greeted to the- <laughs> My socks flew off my toes faster than you could say. <laughs> For some context, reading Sayana Uda was my first ever dive into the wonderful world of literature. Something 8th grade me kept at least 6 feet away from for as long as I could, but like my COVID test results, staying 6 feet would only last for so long. Sayana Uda is kind of infamous for its little less than welcoming introduction into its world, which you know, is, is debatable, but hey, at least it's not this. Now, I've already made the mistake early on of making a video on something that I actually cared a lot about, but because I didn't know how to write a script, and while not much has changed, I can say I've grown enough to recognize that that video no longer deserves any place on this planet. Sayana Uda is a Lovecraftian-esque horror romance visual novel written by the one and only Uru Butcher himself, and it centers around our main protagonist... Antagonist? I, I don't know. Fuminori Saki Saka, a medical student who, after having undergone a near-fatal car crash, suddenly wakes up to a flesh-ridden world filled to the brim with nothing more than blood, guts, and gore. Why? Well, the story needed a plot somehow. This is all allegedly because he had undergone an experimental brain surgery that has retroactively altered the perception of all his basic surroundings. Basically, he's fucked. His vision's fucked, his touch, smell, hearing, taste, like everything in this guy's life is trapped inside a one minute quick Hormel complete spaghetti and meat sauce pack. Oh, and just to add some extra sprinkles on top, both his parents died in the crash too, so he, re he really has nothing left. Thankfully, this visual novel isn't nearly as long as Umineko. In fact, I would have been able to complete this almost 33 times just for it to reach the same length, so this shouldn't be as bad, and oh, never mind, it's way fucking worse. The way that Sina Uda greets us immediately evokes more questions than we know what to do with. What am I looking at? Why is the music so loud? Why can't I understand what they're saying? Did I forget to enable the Japanese locale or something? Is, is this the part I'm supposed to get turned on by? Our mind is instantly placed within the protagonist, Fuminori, where it's made very apparent that something is not right here, and what makes this even more unsettling is the quick realization that these aren't just Lovecrafty and Eldritch creatures. These are his friends. People he's known for years. The inner monologue we see going through his head is so casually expressed that we can tell enough time has passed to where he's lost a sense of fear for this and sees them more as an annoyance than anything. Fearing that he'll be sent back to the hospital, he plays along with their banter since no matter how many MRI scans or tests are done on him, everything is read as being completely healthy and like my imaginary friends keep reminding me, the mental hospital is only going to make it worse. The sensory world that normal people perceive versus what he experiences is left clear as day that this problem resides within him and he knows this. We then abruptly watch the scene play out again in what I like to call non-meat vision, yet this time the roles are completely reversed and what I find especially interesting about this contrast is that regardless of which lens you decide to view the story through, Fuminori is left as the single fish out of water. He is truly isolated, or at least that's, that's what we think. Until this cute hot girl pops up at his bedside. <laughs> Ouch. Um, Kexi, I don't- I don't think you should be saying stuff like that. Like, doesn't she- doesn't she look a little, um, um, young? Yeah. Tell that to the Australian Parliament. And going back to his house, we can also see he's picked up the hobby of painting. One of the biggest positives to a visual novel is obviously being able to see what's actually happening rather than having to imagine it. Some may argue that this can make certain series worse, but personally, as someone who still only reads picture books, I would definitely say that Saya is way more up my alley. Being able to actually see what Fuminori is viewing instantly evokes a sense of sympathy, and even with a lot of the horrible shit he does, being the TikTok influencer empath that I am still makes me feel for the guy. Throughout the VN, the only character 
characters you really get to know are Fuminori and Saya. Yes, the other characters exist and are still good, don't get me wrong, but like the visual novel as a whole, you're only really fed what you absolutely need to eat. There's a lot to unpack in Saya and Uda, even with it being as short as it is, and with the majority of the characters, you end up feeling a sense of distance between them, probably because half of them live in a different plane of reality and the other half are fucking dead. Personally, I was fine with this gap since I think it further added to the sense of isolation that this game prides itself on doing so well, especially when later on you get spooked to find out that some of these characters were lying straight to your face about how much they really knew. And like the title would suggest, Saya is definitely the standout thing within this visual novel. Now, I can't say I remember her actually singing any song, but tossing that aside, Saya's one-track mind and straightforward attitude to eliminating all of life's problems, including but not limited to life itself, is something that I definitely seek in my ideal partner. I can't tell if she lacks jealousy or is a psycho bitch. On one hand, she literally kills her competition, but at the same time, she offers her up to Fuminori like the headless rat my cat left for me on the porch this morning. Saya does a lot of morally bad things without even realizing they're bad, but in a way, that's kind of what this visual novel is trying to convey. To Saya, she's just trying to survive like anyone else, it just so happens that her way of doing that involves wiping out the entire local community of cats and preying on unsuspecting hospital patients. And while yes, some people might consider Saya a little manipulative and not very tentacool, she does over time realize how much this reality has haunted him and gives him, as well as by extension you, the power to make your own choice. Just make sure you choose the right one, or else you're cutting yourself short about three hours. Probably one of Saya Uda's best traits is the absolute lack of empathy to the reader for how grotesque it gets, or how the general populace may perceive it, and in recent years where the all-encompassing movement of diversity has taken precedence over the content itself, this aspect carries a lot more value than people may have once given it credit for. I think just the way that a story like this was able to rely so heavily on psychological fuckery over poppy playtime jump scares says a lot because Poppy Playtime is fucking terrifying. Everything is carried out so matter-of-fact through Fuminori's perspective, because realistically, what is there to actually be scared of? He knows it's all in his head, and you can desensitize yourself to basically anything if you stare at it for long enough. Almost anything. Visually, I don't think Saya could have done a better job portraying how bad living in a world like this would be. I think the art here speaks for itself. Everything, the backgrounds, the CGs, they're all aimed to make you feel as uncomfortable as possible, and the 2003 computer-generated flesh almost adds to the uncanny nature of it. Saya herself really challenges the whole notion of, would you still love me even if I wasn't cute, except it's, would you still love me even if I was a giant mound of Lovecraftian flesh that lied dead to your face and may have accidentally killed like two of your friends, whoops, sorry. Her appearance is very different compared to basically everybody else in this visual novel and makes the rest kind of look like chumps in comparison. And I don't think these other designs are bad, much less forgettable. This was just a contrast that needed to exist. I mean, if everyone looked as good as Saya, then you wouldn't really realize the significance of her being there, right? You know when your significant other is sick, but your love is so strong that you're still willing to catch whatever cold they have? Well, you can imagine that with Saya, but if she was giving you a dozen STDs. And speaking of STDs, Yui Hirasawa uploaded the entire Saya Uda soundtrack to YouTube nine years ago and never came back. Saya Uda's soundtrack is something I've been dreading writing about for the last, um... 1800 words, because I don't want to understate how much I like it. Every song has its own little charm in giving you the spooks and goofs. You'll either get a song like Schizophrenia that sounds exactly how you think it would, or a more somber piece like Silent Sorrow, and no matter which song you choose, you'll be left with an empty void in not only your heart, but also your hands after realizing Sai still isn't waiting at the foot of your bed. Trust me, I, I already checked. <laughs> I can't stare off into the sunset with my friends anymore without the melancholic tears rolling up in my eyes, which is fine, because I don't think I've ever done that. Sabbath is the only song that doesn't make me want to tear my hair out until you click the start button and realize you got God. Clocking in at only around 6 or 7 hours, which let me tell you, in visual novel terms, is fucking chicken scraps, makes this a really digestible visual novel. And in a world where VNs meander and repeat themselves at nauseum, it was definitely a nice change of pace considering the pacing you typically get. Like the wise Genner Ubuchi once said, I have nothing but contempt for the deceitful thing men call happiness. And personally, I really like Sayana Uda, so I guess I missed the point. Thanks for tuning in, come back next week to watch me talk about why Torador and Freddy Fazbear share the same universe. Bye! <laughs>